We continue with Ian Chair. Ian Chair is a technical guru, an expert. He knows which charger to use. He's a veteran tech reporter, formerly a CNET. Apple did their iPhone 15 unveil and everything else yesterday, including the idea that they finally gotten on board with not trying to steal money from everyone by selling you a separate charger for another 30 bucks after you buy the phone. Mm -hmm. um, that's the last concession we'll get from Apple, though, right, Ian? Uh, well, we'll see. Uh, it is worth noting that that concession actually came as a result of the European Union setting a regulation that all phones sold in Europe starting at, or at the end of next year have to have this common charger, which is called USB-C, which has become very popular in the tech industry. If you don't have an iPhone, you probably already are using this charger. Sure. It's kind of Android's old had it for a couple of years. Yes, exactly. And even Apple, by the way, uses it with their laptops and, ta and tablets. So, you know, them uh, kind of moving over to this, in a lot of ways, yes, the European Union forced their hand, but uh, it's good for all of us, right? It means that there's going to be potentially a lot less e-waste, right? Because we're not going to be throwing out as many cords. And when you get to a friend's house, you're not going to have to ask them if they have an Android or a, an iPhone, uh, when, before you charge your phone, you'll just be able to pick up the cord because you'll know uh, they all have the same cord. You can just plug it in, which is, uh, I think, the best part. It's, so it's it, great news. Yeah. No, so, it's, it really is. So no. when rolling this out yesterday, uh, they also rolled out the iPhone 15. And one of the complaints over the last three or four iterations of the iPhone was they've run out of ideas. There's nothing new they can do with the phone <laughs> other than charging ports. What's new? Uh, so the biggest changes they made, actually, uh, as as you would expect, kind of, are uh, in the camera where they put a ton of effort. Everyone uh, in the tech industry spends uh, ungodly amounts of money on their on uh, kind of researching these cameras and batteries, which are the number one things that people look for. So the new cameras in the iPhones are supposed to have uh, better zoom in them, which for people who care, that's a good deal. Um, and then the other thing that they did is that they added a couple of really quality of life stuff. For example, um, you may remember last year they had satellite texting if you are outside of cellular range. So this was something that was designed initially as kind of a, uh, a you know, if you're if you're in danger, let's say you're in the middle of 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 nowhere, you know, driving on the highway, there's no cell service or there's actually someone who fell off a cliff in California and they had no cell service. Um, you're able to actually uh, still have the phone connect with a satellite that's orbiting Earth. Uh, there's there's a couple of dozen of them, and it can send a call for help. Now, this year, they're adding the ability to work with AAA. So <laughs> if you're stuck out there without gas in the middle of nowhere, uh, you'll be able to ask AAA to come over and uh, get you some gas. So a couple of follow-ups. You know, just as I did all my homework trying to understand USB 2, USB 3, the lightning, and now we're going back to USB-C, now that I just figured it all out. But back to the camera, the new phone, what maybe the big difference is the price? Is it lower? So the f prices have roughly stayed the same. Uh, you know, they start uh, at um, or the pro models, right, which are the ones that a lot of people pay attention to, start at $999. But one of the things that Apple did with the uh, most expensive version, the Pro Max, which is the bigger one, mm -hmm. is that they got rid of the cheapest version of it. <laughs> so they raised the price uh, by $100 if you're planning to buy it. Um, but they they will fight tooth and nail on that and say, well, we didn't really raise the price because it's the same price we would have charged you for the same phone. It's just we don't have the cheaper one anymore. So you can you can you can feel how about that however you want. But it's definitely, um, you know, one of the things where Apple is 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 essentially trying to get people who buy the pro models, the more expensive ones to pay a little more. But what is it that's actually going to get people up and out of their seats and to the store to get this new phone if they're one of those hangers on that say, nah, yeah, I can get another two years out of this? Well, statistically, that's exactly how most people are. Uh, we are actually holding on to our phones longer and longer. Um, and that means typically we're replacing our phones every two to four years. 
And actually, a lot of the companies have gotten used to that. One of the ways that they're they're dealing with it is by having really good trade-in offers. So already, for example, T-Mobile and AT&T, and I believe Verizon as well, has started offering $1,000 off if you bring in a phone that's even relatively old. Uh, so that's one way to kind of hook people in. Um, and one of the other things is that Apple's business model has always been about incremental updates every year, right? That's part of what's fascinating about them is that, um, you know, every year to year, it kind of seems a little boring, but if you're going, you know, three or four years difference, you're going to feel a major change because in the last uh, four years, for example, Apple added magnetic charging, they added significantly better cameras, the screen is always on, those types of things that uh, would really mean something to someone who's upgrading over time. So that that's part of how Apple is actually strategizing is they're not trying to get you to buy every year, although there are super fans who do. They are really trying to think through, okay, well, in three years, what's going to blow you away that's different from what you have in your hand right now? Well, and, and the, the trade-in thing is interesting to me because I just switched smartwatches. I had a Samsung smartwatch for three or four years, and there was nothing wrong with it. It just hung on and hung on, but I finally decided to make a change. The battery was slowly kind of dying out. And, right. And this is literally <laughs> like a three- or four-year-old watch, and they gave me 150 bucks for it in a trade-in. Wow which seems crazy high. How is that a business model? Well, what happens is that the, uh, it depends on who's giving you the trade in Samsung, but direct. if, if it was who Samsung directly Samsung. So Samsung is actually using marketing money often to, uh, to convince you, right? So they are willing to take a little bit of hit on the profits, which, um, statistically, Apple and Samsung are pretty much the only companies right now making any profits off of phones. Uh, and so they're they're essentially willing to take some of those profits and uh, convince you to stick around. Um, Apple, by the way, does a very similar thing. Um, and the carriers often offer better trade in value because they are willing to give up even more of their profits because they are constantly fighting amongst each other to convince you to stick, stay with AT&T, sure. T-Mobile, or Verizon. So they are used to losing that money anyway. And so that's where they put a lot of that. So, so the whole deal often, is Samsung's just trying to keep me around. They want me to stay. They don't want me to pack my suitcase and go. All right. Yes. I get and, it. No, and, I get it. I get it. It makes yeah. sense. Can you hang for a second? But we have many more questions for you, Ian. We, Absolutely. All right, stick Absolutely. around. Ian, share more in a moment. We'll tell you how you can stay in touch with everything Ian's writing about and talking about. And uh, Jane uh, wants a deal on her next phone. So stand by yeah. for that. Ian shares here. Hey, Ian, I've, I've got to ask you, uh, you know, and I'm probably being too hard on them because a lot of the Senate average age 204, mm. they're very tech savvy. <laughs> but today they're having tech leaders come in and talk about AI to the Senate. I don't know how much, you know, I think about, I'm 62 and I think I'm fairly tech savvy. Stop laughing, Miranda. I think I'm fairly tech savvy. And these guys are literally 20 years older than me. And when somebody explains something to you from a technical standpoint, Ian, you deal with this every day where you have to explain things. There's a generational divide and a level of understanding that's not there. So I don't care how much time your advisors in the Senate talk to you. This hearing today looks like it's going to be nonstop entertainment. Yes. Uh, well, entertainment, I don't know about. Or <laughs> fear. Could be fearful. <laughs> I, I I think it'll be it'll be just depressing <laughs> myself. I, I've been in the room in the Senate and House chambers so many times now as they've yelled at tech executives. I was there when Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, was hauled before Congress for the first time. And, uh, you know, the, the thing that has always come out of it, the point you bring up about entertainment, is that it's it's shocking how even though uh, all of the American public, statistically, right, there has been polling uh, and both sides of Congress, Republicans and Democrats, all agree that the tech industry needs to have uh, stricter regulations. They can't figure out how to do it. And it's 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 embarrassing. And this is something that uh, continues apace. Right. We started a lot of these hearings in 2018. And, uh, you know, these these hearings on A.I., are are going to continue in a lot of ways. And look, I mean, tech for a lot of people seems like magic. And I get that, right? I mean, uh, there's a reason that the internet, whenever you see it, 
in uh in a flow chart it, there's a little cloud right because you know it's 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 really magical how it all works but also i would argue this is why they have they have staff right this is why they have all these people who are supposed to work for them and help them understand these things so that they can make laws on behalf of the american people and, and ai and it, is frightening ai is said uh, chat gpt is frightening and, and you can go to the why can't we take the positive side and the positive view that's all well and good but laws need to be designed well, to protect you misuse. from inevitabilities yeah. where something could be misused and if these well, guys don't yeah. understand it, how are they going to craft things to control it? Right. And 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 by the way, it's gotten so bad now that the European Union, we were talking about USB-C on the iPhone uh, just a few minutes ago. Uh, the European Union's really taken the front lead on regulating the tech industry. And, and by the way, it's worth noting that even the U.S. government has gotten really frustrated with this. And the executive branch, right, not the legislative branch, has uh, started filing antitrust laws, uh, antitrust suits. And in fact, one of the biggest ones since Microsoft 20 years ago kicked off uh, yesterday in Washington against Google. So there are efforts happening, even if Congress can't get on its ball. Um, but it's, it, it is, you know, these are really important things. And especially when you bring up AI, uh, it, you know, the the implications already, it's only, it hasn't even been a year since ChatGPT was made available to the public. Mm -hmm. And already, Hundreds of millions of people are using it. We are seeing companies left and right starting to uh, try and replace workers with it, with very bad results, by the way. And, uh, you know, there it's no question that this thing is going to change the way that all of us work, right? It, it, whether or not it puts us out of a job. And so it is important for Congress to at least understand how it works. Yeah, absolutely. And you so... I like ChatGPT. I like Google Bard, but I understand that there could be, people could misuse them and again putting people out of work. How quickly will we see some laws for this artificial intelligence and also some rules around social media? Well, if you look at history, uh typically what ends up happening is that something bad, something very bad has to happen before Congress can really get their mind wrapped around what needs to be done. So uh, I hate to put it that way. But right now, the unemployment rate is very, very low, right? It's near its record lows. And uh, generally speaking, um, things don't look that bad in the numbers. So, of course, Congress is doing some other stuff. I, I, I don't know what it's going to take ultimately. I will say that one of the things that's happening is that the public conversation, right? And, and among journalists like myself and a lot of my peers, we're, we're publicly forcing some of these conversations much earlier than we were on social networking, right? I think that a lot of people uh, didn't really critically look at social networking until after the 2016 election. And this time around, we're, we're, we're kind of speed running this, right? This time around hasn't even been a year and we're very critically looking at it. And I think that that ultimately hope you know i hope uh the history books will show that um that that was a good choice that we are we are having these conversations now as a culture about what we're going to do about it well and like the bottom line is when it comes to chad G gpt and all these things this is sort of the basis of the sag after strike it's a big part of it. it's not being talked about sure. in the same way but streaming yes. rights and things of that nature are also directly tied to the idea that people are going to lose their jobs because chat gpt and ai are going to take those jobs away we saw jobs get eliminated in mass when there wasn't regulation in retail, and Amazon came in as the yeah. big behemoth. But you can't. And there solely... wasn't regulation, but you have to. No, no, you no. You have to you... at some point step in and yes. say one can't do all of this damage to another, and that's what could happen if we don't have these asshats in Congress. That's a technical term. Uh, figure out which way is up and a way to properly ask these questions and properly craft the law to do something about it. All right, back to the phone. Some simple questions from folks. There are no stupid questions. Um, and let me get to a couple of these, starting here. Um, watches, like the one I was talking about. Would you recommend getting a new watch, or can you replace a battery on a watch? And do companies like Apple and Samsung allow that? Or do they make them proprietary where you got to buy a new one? Well, they are proprietary for sure. There are also actually people out there who will uh, specialize in replacing the battery on the watch. 
Uh, I would say that for the most part, uh, people tend to replace the watch entirely. It's very much like the AirPods. Um, and it's not as easy as it is with the phones. Uh, it's worth noting, by the way, that uh, this year, Apple actually put in a number of features to make it easier to replace the battery and other other stuff inside. So credit to them for that. A lot of companies have been doing it lately. Uh, so when it comes to the watch, uh, really, I would lean on kind of what you did, right? These trade-in deals. Yeah. Um, Apple in particular has been really playing up that it recycles these things. It doesn't just toss them in the trash. And they actually claim that this year, every watch that they sell that's new is going to be carbon neutral. And you can go on their websites to get all the statistics on that. Uh, you can decide for yourself whether that matters or not, uh, but it, they definitely are trying to make a point of saying, look, uh, we you can trust us to at least handle it for you instead of having to uh, worry about whether it's going in the trash pile. Got another texter who said, I always see things about how many gigs this has and how many gigs that has. If I get a new iPad, how much do I need? Well, that really depends on who you are, right? And the way that I figure out for most people is that with their computer, tablet, phone, whatever, there is a setting you can go to, right? It's in settings, usually under the general information. Uh, and you, you can actually find out how much data you are using right now, how much storage. And so typically what I tell people is that whatever you're using, <laughs> you want to double what you're going to get next time, right? So if you're using 512 and you're using all those 512, uh, gigabytes, then get yourself a terabyte. Most people uh, I've found, and even the shutter bugs, right? My my mother-in-law is definitely a shutter bug, um, and I love her for it, but uh, she doesn't actually need that much on her phone because even though she takes a ton of photos, they get backed up to the internet, they go other places, and so as a result, she can get the cheapest model and still be fine. So I would recommend looking at those settings for yourself to know what you might need. Um, the last thing I'll bring up, professionals, right? People who are taking a lot of high-end video and stuff like that, they often buy the more expensive ones. But otherwise, it's kind of like buying a Ferrari to drive down a uh, suburb street. Sure. Give me a quick answer on this last <laughs> one because you mentioned it. Um, um, and we've had this question in multiple ways. People are saying, everything comes back to Google. I'm supposed to buy this much storage from Google and I'm supposed to trust that Google's going to take care of everything. How come we don't hear more about Google security and are they really taking care of all of our data? Well, we definitely talk about Google security a lot. I think if you uh, look in a lot of the coverage in the tech industry over the last two years, it's something that a lot of people are discussing. It's not just Google, by the way, Apple too. There's a lot of concerns that because Apple has all their manufacturing, vast majority of it in China, that they have to kind of bow to the Chinese government a lot more. Um, and this is something that is particularly worrisome as China keeps rattling savers against Taiwan, right, which they claim is a part of their country. And Taiwan happens to be a major manufacturing center. So look, I, I think that the reality is that these companies are starting to have to at least be public about a lot of these issues. And this comes back to Congress, right? Who has the power to be able to force them to do right? It's really us, right, with our economic power, which we don't really exercise in mass, or it's also Congress. And uh, it comes right back to for pushing your congressman to take this stuff seriously. How do we stay in touch with the insurer? Well, um, I do still use uh, whatever that thing Twitter is called. <laughs> the X. Twitter or X or whatever. The um, X. It, it, you know, yeah, Ian Sure is, it, you know, it's very easy to find me on any social network that way. Um, and then also, uh, you know, I, I publish all the time. Uh, so you can you can find my work all over the place. <laughs> I A N S H E double -R, R I A N S H E double -R, R. Zoom said we're done with this. It's like bit. a cliffhanger, including with. Yeah. Over. So, but we like Ian very much. We'll and find he's him helpful. on X. We'll get him again, but follow yep. him on Twitter he's and everywhere great. else.